Okay, I am actually on. So we're just going to set up a little bit tonight. We're doing our Facebook Live with Dr. Alan Kalis, and he's from Avenue Plastic Surgery in Victoria. And I'm just going to do a little invite for him now. So just bear with me a sec. Okay, so um, I've sent that invite now, so we'll just stick around for a minute and see. I've got a little weather fell. Yep. Oh, good. So you, if you accept that, Dr. Kalis, we'll be able to see each other. Yeah. Yeah. There should be a little icon. Um, I'll just make sure there should be a little something coming up. Great. I'm just going to make sure that I'm on the right page because <laughs> I don't want to be on my own Facebook. I want to be on the group because today, when we were testing it out today, I was actually on my own Facebook. So you haven't actually accepted it yet, Dr. Kalis, have you? Mm. I can't see you. Hang on, I'll try again. Okay. Okay, no, so what you've done is you've actually just liked it. So you have to um, accept the invite that I sent you. So I sent you a little invite. So there should be a little... Yeah, I've sent you a little... Um, there should be a little green bubble or something. you just got to accept the yes to it. That's it. Okay. We are just about on. I'm going to hang. So you. That's it. Okay. We are just about on. I'm going to hang. We're on. So you. That's it. Okay. We are just about on. Great. Hi, Tristan. We're on. Can you hear me? I can hear you. How oh, are you, wow. Dr. Kalis? I'm very well, thank you, Trish. How are you? Excellent. Good, good. Thank you so much for taking the time to have a chat with us um, tonight on this Facebook Live. It's a pleasure, great pleasure. Yeah. It's, it's well, great, it's great um, to use this new technology. Yes, I know. Well, tonight's the first night we're actually doing a, um, a two-way because normally people yeah. would just be talking or you would just be talking and there'd be no interaction. So this is good. So I can take the questions from the people as they're coming up on my um, other screen. So I'll leave that open over there. And um, yeah, then if there's any questions, I can actually um, see them come up and I can ask you as they come up as well, just to make it a, make your job a little bit easier. Oh, that's great. So tell me, do the other people who come on, do they see you or do they see me? They'll see us both. See us both. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Pretty good, hey? Pretty good. <laughs> So now I know we've emailed you some questions through today that, that um, had already come through. I'm just going to set this up so that I can actually look at any questions that come up as they go. And I'll mute myself on that screen over there. Um, but it'll take a couple of minutes for people to start to come on. We've got a few people online um, already, but it'll take a couple of minutes just for the you know okay. for people to refresh their screen and see that we're going, we're going on here. So I'll just give them a bit of a, um, a background about yourself and you can tell me if it, it you know, if I've missed anything out, which I know I'll miss a lot out, but okay, we're on. I'm just going to pause this, okay. mute this, so I don't have to hear myself on there. Perfect. Um, so um, I know we've got lots of questions here tonight, ladies. This is um, pretty exciting. Um, organic breast augmentation or fat transfer to the breast seems to be, um, it's Dr. Callis' specialty. Dr. Callis has been doing it for how many years, Dr. Callis? About five years now into the breasts. Okay, so Dr. Kaz has been doing it for about five years. He've done, he's done hundreds of these procedures. And just bear in mind that every surgeon has a different procedure. Every surgeon has a different way of doing things. 
So probably um, the very first question that I'm going to ask Dr. Kalis is, um, what actually sets you apart from other surgeons doing this technique, Dr. Kalis? Might as well get that up and out front first thing. Okay. Well, first of all, it's interesting that not many surgeons are yet doing it in Australia. Um, there are a number in the United States, and there are a number in France, and just a few in Australia. And the reason is that the surgeons are not covered by their medical insurance to do the procedure. Um, they don't have the experience and the training, and so their medical indemnity insurance has not given them the go-ahead to do this procedure, which is considered, uh, after all, a fairly new procedure. And understandably, the health insurance funds are concerned about potential complications, and, uh, and they want to sh be sure that the surgeons who do the procedure um, are adequately trained and experienced in it. So um, I'm fortunate that about five years ago, my insurance company did uh, indemnify me against the procedure and we've been uh, um, able to do it since then. So I guess what sets me apart, first, I'm one of the few surgeons even who offer the procedure. Um, secondly, the experience, we've been doing it now for five years plus, And that means that we've done over 400 procedures. So we um, have had a, a good opportunity to know what works, what doesn't work. Um, in which, uh, for which women it's suitable and for which women it's not suitable. Um, over those five years, we've developed and refined our technique uh, constantly, really. And um, it's a technique which is different from that which is done by other surgeons around the world. And we have proven results. We know that our technique works and we, and we get great results with the way we handle and the way we graph the fat. So our the time we've spent, the experience, the technique, and last but not least, our staff, who are also very experienced. And um, there's a six-week uh, intensive aftercare program with fat transfer to ensure the fat cells take and then grow in the breast. And our staff are just very, very uh, on board with this, very excited by it, and um, with every patient. And um, it really is a, um, a joint venture between us and the patient to do something exciting like this, to take fat from one part of the body and then to prepare it and then to graft it into another part and then to see it grow, to see it flourish. It's really quite an exciting thing to do. Mm. Well, I, I just attended that um, conference that, of course, you were at recently um, in Melbourne about breast augmentation, and it seemed um, a lot more like a couple of years ago, probably there was people when it didn't even want to talk about it, whereas now people are realising that this is definitely something that's, that's becoming popular and a few more surgeons are taking it on. Um, so I'm really excited to, you know, that we've got you to be able to tell us a yeah. lot about it as well. So that's right. We... So Trish, you, you know, it's, it's been the, the rate of increase in the U S at the moment, uh, where they have some figures, it's going up at about 30% a year, the number of cases. So it's rapidly increasing. And I expect in, a, in two or three years, um, There'll be lots and lots of surgeons doing it. Many women will be out there talking about it. Um, but it's important still to know that it's not for everyone. You know, it's a procedure which does have its limitations. And um, uh, I don't think it'll ever replace entirely uh, breast augmentation using implants. And then part of the experience of having done a lot of cases is, is to know when to say, well, it's not suitable for you. Mm -hmm. And Of course, you do breast implants as well. Of course, like yeah. Yeah, you'll do them both as well. So, and, I, and so my, my, I... my background, I, I've put in, you know, more than 6,000 breast implants over my career. And, uh, but, you know, anyone who thinks about breast implants, you, if you think about it, it's just a round spacer that fits inside the chest. You're not really augmenting the breast. You're not putting it inside the breast. You're not really changing the breast. You're just putting something on the rib cage and pushing the breast forwards. It's just a spacer. So, and, and of course, it has so many problems. We know um, over the years, all the difficulties, all the, the many women we see who come to us who say, look, they, they wish they'd never had breast implants. And many women have had multiple operations. Um, so really, the stimulus for fat grafting came from, from that and asking the question, is there a better way? Could there be a better way? And fat grafting has been around for many, many years. We've been using it in the lips and the cheeks, 
But putting the fat into the breast was something else altogether. We were also worried that we'd get lumps and that the women would um, confuse these with breast cancer. Um, and it wasn't until about five or six years ago that the radiologist told us that when they do a mammogram, they can distinguish between a, a lump of fat tissue and a breast cancer 100% of the time. So once they gave us that uh, uh, go-ahead, we started um, uh, experimenting with putting fat into the breast. And I guess it's grown from there. And we now have a, a, a procedure which, um, for some women, is a very good alternative to using implants. Hmm. And I noticed as well, uh, one of the things that, that was um, um, something that's going to be trending is what they're calling a hybrid breast augmentation where they're doing the implants as well as the fat transfer as well just to sort of give it a bit more shape uh, and different exactly so, so you're already ahead of your time trish because hybrid is, is really very new but of course women who are very thin breast implants never look quite right you can often see the edge of the implant uh, implants are, are not really good for the cleavage um, and whereas fat can be put um, very precisely into the cleavage area into the upper pole um, and it's a wonderful way um, to add to the, uh, the beauty of a breast after putting an implant in. Um, mm -hmm. And also we're doing it a lot with breast lifts now. Whenever we do a breast lift procedure, we're putting a little bit of fat just into the cleavage in the upper pole just to give a bit of extra oomph to the breast. So um, it's got m multiple uses like this. It's a very, very exciting new area. Yes, totally. Well, we should get on to our questions, otherwise you'll be okay. on your dinner tonight. <laughs> so, um, do you want me to read them to you? Yes, go ahead, please. Yeah, all right. So, one of the ladies asks, um, who's suitable for breast fat transfer and exactly how much fat does a patient need to have to be able to use it for their fat transfer? Okay. So, primarily, a woman who's interested in her health and well-being. And... And um, we see lots of ladies now who are very athletic um, and they're very careful what they eat and they just would not have an implant put into their body. And they come along and say, well, is fat transfer an option for me? What exactly? What's the volume? What can I expect? Am I wasting my money having a fat transfer? So, you know, I've had to become a bit of a fat hunter. I've had to find fat where no one thought fat existed before. And usually even in, in thin women I can get enough for about a one cup size increase usually and um, when we talk about volume you know, what, what is a cup size it, uh, if a woman wears a 10 bra each cup size is 125 mils so an A cup is 125 mils a B cup is 250 a C cup is 375 mils so if a woman comes along and she has an A cup, she's 125 mils of her own volume, all I need to do is, is do, produce another 125 mils and that'll give her a B cup, and a fully natural B cup. And that's what we usually try to do. Okay. So is there a, I know this is not on there, but it's just brought up a question for me. So is there a, um, a limit to how much you can do in one session? Like, like if I had like, three litres of fat to remove. I don't even know. That. If the, is that legal to remove that much fat in Australia? If yes. I had three litres of fat removed? Yes. So the first thing you need to know, Trish, is once we remove the fat, n not all of it is suitable for fat transfer. And again, some surgeons do put all the fat in. And obviously then half, if not all of the fat, will die. There'll be so many blood cells. There'll be such an inflammatory response. And I think that's one of the reasons that some surgeons say the fat doesn't last. We find that, that, let's say I took one litre of fat from a person, which is quite normal to take a litre of excess fat from the hips and thighs and tummy. A lot of women will easily get a litre. By the time we've put it through our purification processes, we end up with half of that, 500 mils, which is 250 per side. So I guess the, the commonest procedure, we're putting in about 200 to 250 per side, quite easily. And that gives us a very nice sort of a one and a half cup size increase. Um, but of course, there's some people who are very thin and we have to make the best of what we've got. On the other hand, occasionally my dream girl comes along with lots of fat. And that wouldn't be me. <laughs> <laughs> no, not at all. But then, um, then I guess the, the, the most we've 
the most we've put in is 350 cc's or mils per side. That's the most. Um, what can tend to happen as you're putting the fat in, the breast becomes very, very tense. And we can't have it so tense that the blood supply is shut off. Otherwise, the fat won't survive. So we have to judge it a little bit, move the fat around the breast, make sure it's all comfortable sitting there. So that after all, because the fat has to grow, has to survive in the breast. So um, it's true that women with lots of fat that can produce a bit more, we might get to 300 or 350, but usually about 250 mils is, is about the limit that we put in. Okay. All right. Um, is breast fat transfer permanent and are the results, or are the results long lasting? So when you talk about permanent, um, this has to be seen against the background that a woman's breasts change all her life. Um, the breasts are made up of, of two uh, types of tissue. There's the breast gland, which obviously will change um, in size due to hormonal factors with the menstrual cycle, with pregnancy and so on. So, um, in fact, they'll t change inside. If, if, a, inside so if a woman stops taking the pill, her breasts may get a bit smaller, for example. So there's the glandular side of the breast, and there's also the fat tissue in the breast. And what we are augmenting is the fatty tissue. And, of course, the fat will vary in size according to her weight. If a woman puts on uh, some weight, the, the, the fat cells will all grow. And if a woman loses weight, the fat cells will all become a bit smaller. So what we like to do with fat transfer is to transfer stubborn fat, you know, fat from the hips or thighs a woman just can't get rid of. And we like to do it when she's at or near her normal weight. And once that stubborn fat goes into her breast, it's unlikely to go anywhere. So it's likely to stay. Indeed, if she puts on a bit of weight, it's probably going to be the first bit of fat that, that actually increases in size. So that's what we find. We, we like to have the patient at or, or near their ideal weight and then to put on a kilo after the operation because we want the fat cells to feel loved and to grow in their, in their location. But certainly all our studies now are out at six months, 12 months, three years, and um, even five years now after the surgery. And we're finding that the, the breasts are, are staying their size and even growing. In fact, we have two patients now who asked me to put in as much fat as I could find and they went away and put on some weight. And now they've come back and say, you know, my breasts are now too large. I'd like you to do some liposuction to remove some of the fat. So really, we don't know the limits. It's biological. The fat is, is now in your breast and it depends on your lifestyle as to what happens to the fat afterwards. Yeah, right. Because uh, that makes a lot of sense because um, I know a few ladies who've had a breast reduction and then their breasts have grown back. Absolutely. And I'm pretty sure in each one of those women they'd put on a little bit of weight and that's whether it was that time of their life or whatever when it went menopause in and yeah they've put on weight and their boobs have got bigger again absolutely but you know um but it's all natural it's a they've got their own yeah. natural fat in their breast they've got a yeah. larger version of their own breast with more fat and then how yeah. they look after their bodies is up to them but compare this with breast implants where in some series there's a 25% reoperation rate even in the first two years. And every surgeon now says you, could ex you should expect to have your implants changed every eight or ten years. And you yeah. can expect to have two or three per in your lifetime. So really, and with fat transfer, you know, if a person um, feels that they'd like a little bit more fat put in their breast later on, they couldn't indeed, they could do that. Yeah. We've, we've got about now... I think five patients that where we've we've done a secondary procedure, and the fact it's like it takes even better the second time round. So I've just had I, I know mm. the answer to this question, yeah. but this is a funny <clears> question because <throat> this would in an ideal world this would just be perfect. Can my stubborn fat be harvested and donated to someone else? Only your twin sister, if you have one. Oh really? <laughs> So is that true? That would be true. So twins, of course, are, it, it, so long as she's identical, are genetically yeah. identical, so you could transfer yeah. it to a twin. But you can't transfer it to anyone else because it will be rejected just like another organ. Now, of course, we, theoretically, we could do it like we do kidney transplants, but it would mean that you would be on immunosuppression and there'd be so many other medical problems that we really yeah, wouldn't, wouldn't do it. And, and 
uh, someone, I spoke about this the other day with someone and I thought, well, who knows what can happen in five or ten years? Absolutely. Like we just don't know, hey. Absolutely. If, if, if we could turn off the um, uh, yeah. immune receptor cells, we could do that, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Let me ask the next question. How big can a patient go with breast fat transfer? Like how many, well, I mean, you're probably going to have answered some of these questions, but yeah, how I many know. cup sizes can you increase and... Can you have a second op to increase the size if you're not happy with the first outcome? Yeah. And does this cost as much as the first procedure? Yeah, okay. So these are questions people often ask. So, look, certainly you could have a second operation. And, you know, we have had a few people that have had a second procedure and it works extremely well. Uh, we call it a top-up operation. And it costs about two-thirds of the original operation because we're not going for as much fat as we can get. We're usually going just for enough just to do the cleavage or just to add another half a cup size or something like that. Um, I guess the most cup sizes I've gone up have been maybe three, but I wouldn't want to say that.